have a question for you. I hope I know what your answer would be. Does God keep his word? Can you count on what God says? I read to you from Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 through 10. And this is the occasion where God came down and promised Abraham that his descendants would be as the stars of the sky, as the sand on the sea. Numerous, numerous, numerous. And he took him outside. God took Abraham out. Now look toward the heavens and count the stars. Are you able to count them? And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed the Lord, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, And he said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? I thought that was an interesting question that Abraham asked God after the verse before it just said, and he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He says, how can I know this to be true? And this is where one of the more interesting things of the Old Testament took place. <coughs> verse 9. He said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old male ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. So apparently on one side was the dove and on the other side was the pigeon. And in between the carcasses was the blood that had been shed in cutting those carcasses in two. At this point in time, it's helpful to understand that this was the way that the rulers of kingdoms and the officials made a blood covenant with one another. They would take the animals of their idols, in that case, and they would cut them in two, divide them, and then they would make an agreement, and then each one of the rulers would walk through the blood. And this is why that was called a blood covenant. Now, let's continue on, because at this point in time, nothing had yet happened. And so... What happens then is Abraham drives the vultures, the, the birds of prey, away from the carcasses, but he doesn't pass through between the carcasses yet. In fact, we're going to find that Abraham never does pass through the blood covenant carcasses. But let's continue reading. Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. Now when the sun was going down... A deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, a terror and a great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And it came about, verses 17 and 18, that when the sun set, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Only God in his presence passed through upon the trail of blood. You see, this was a covenant that God was making to Abraham, and Abraham wasn't involved in his part of it. God says, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do this so that your descendants will be many. I'm going to give your descendants this land. And through your descendants, Genesis chapter 12, 
Jesus Christ will come. This is what my covenant is with you. This was a one-sided covenant. And we're going to see that that same thing is going to happen a little bit later. Why would God go to the trouble of doing something that Abraham understood in making this a blood covenant? I can only think of one reason. God wanted Abraham to know how precious, how serious, and how he had bound this covenant upon himself without a shadow of doubt. Covenants normally represent something that is important. But in this case, there was nothing more that God could have done to prove to Abraham, I mean what I say. I mean what I say. This was not a sacrifice. For in the case of a sacrifice, the animals would have been burned up. This was a covenant. This was a covenant. Now, I do not know the tradition that existed back then enough to know whether they ate the animals after they were passed through and the blood was on both the feet of the people who had passed through. But I also understand that this was a bit of a prophecy. Do you think of any other time in the history of Israel where God provided food represented by the oven and God provided a pillar of fire to guide them by night? This is a prefiguring of God's exodus for the children of Israel out of Egypt and his provision for them and his guidance for them through the wilderness. What an amazing, wonderful way to illustrate not only did God mean what he said, that he was going to keep his word, but that he was going to bless and guide the children of Israel. There's a passage in the book of Hebrews that talks about this very thing. It says in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 17 through 18, and I bring that so you can see the whole passage. So when God desired to show more convincingly, it wasn't God that needed to know if he meant his word, that he meant what he said. It was the people who needed to understand this is a precious thing I'm giving to you. I will keep my word. This is important. And here's what it says. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, promise and an oath, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. What reason do we have to hold fast to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? Because God said it and God backed it up. In the Old Testament, by passing through the blood of those divided carcasses, a blood covenant, and by giving it as a promise and backing it up with an oath. Well, that brings us to the next point. Does Jesus keep his word? Did he back up the message that he brought to earth? Did he say, I'm showing you in the greatest possible way that I can show you. I mean what I say, and I'm backing up what I said by the shedding of my blood. How precious would this message be? How important would it be for heaven to come down in the form of Jesus Christ and give us a message? 
and then say, here's how important it is. I'm going to die for this covenant and show you how important it is. You know, there are some things I believe I would die for. I believe I'd die for my wife. I believe if I were called to be a soldier and in the battlefield, I would die for my fellow soldiers, for my country. But there are just a lot of things I won't die for. There's just a whole lot of things I wouldn't die for. We found a diamond ring a long time ago. Kay had it made into a tie tack, and I, I normally wear it. A diamond that didn't cost us anything. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't die for this thing. I wouldn't even think about dying for this thing. I wouldn't die for my car. I wouldn't die for my house. If this building were to burn down, I wouldn't die for it either. What would Jesus die for? The most precious thing he could give to humanity. The hope of salvation. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 13 through 15. Because you see, Jesus made a blood covenant not by passing through the carcasses of animals as was the tradition when Abraham was living, but by giving his own blood on the cross. Listen to this. Hebrews 9, 13 through 15. It first talks about the Old Covenant. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who had been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How precious is the covenant that Jesus brought and died to establish. For this reason, verse 15, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Not a covenant put into effect by animal blood, but a covenant put into effect by his own blood. So let me ask you a question. Answer it in your own head. Here is a covenant ratified by animal blood, here is a covenant ratified by divine blood. Which one is the most precious? There is no question. This is why the covenant of Christ, His blood, replaced the old covenant, animal blood. And that's why this covenant is so precious. He is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death his, has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So how does Jesus describe the Lord's Supper, the cup, the fruit of the vine? Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28 says, when he instituted the Lord's Supper and when he was talking about the fruit of the vine, this is my blood of the covenant. When we pick up that little glass, plastic, whatever it may be, and drink of that grape juice, we are committing to ourselves and to the world and to God himself. That is the covenant by which we live. It's not just remembering that he shed his blood on the cross. That's not what he said. He did not say, this is the blood of the cross. He said in Mark 14, in verse 24, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Or in Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Yes, remember the blood he shed on the cross. But when you drink the contents of that, you are remembering his death, 
but you are committing yourself to live by the new covenant that was put into effect by His blood. How precious is that blood? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink of it. But I want to take us now into something that would normally be considered negative. But when we remember what is being protected, we understand. To what length would Jesus go to to protect and guard that covenant? I want you to listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14. Now, you do remember the four challenges we've already looked at? The Grecian widows were being neglected. The church had to remember to take care of everyone. You remember the Gentiles were now going to become Christians. Jews now were responsible for treating Gentiles with the same respect they treated each other. Both needed salvation equally. The law of Moses no longer in effect, and yet how some wanted to bring that into the church. They wanted to bring this animal cleanse covenant into the Christ cleansed blood covenant. Jesus said, don't do that. Continuing on. The idols, they wanted to bring some of their paganism in. But perhaps the greatest challenge that has ever faced the church and faces today God keeps His word. Jesus keeps His word. The greatest challenge is will we remain true to the new covenant put into effect by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to how Jesus wanted His Word guarded. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and, verse, and chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. In verse, uh, pardon me, got to the wrong page too soon. Chapter 7, verse 15. I want you to listen to what Jesus says. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. What is he guarding against? He is guarding against polluting the covenant that he made. That's what he's guarding against. And how will these people treat the covenant that Jesus built when they come in as false teachers? They will chew it to pieces like a wolf chews a lamb to pieces. Are there people today who want to chew the new covenant of Jesus to pieces? Take some of it, add something here, add something there? The answer is yes. But Jesus is guarding that which is precious. You know, I walked into Fort Knox about 20 years ago, told them to open up the doors, and I walked in and walked out with six bars of gold. Do you believe that? Why don't you believe it? They're not about to let me in there. They're not about to let me walk out. Why? Because that's considered precious, and you guard that which is precious. You guard that which is precious. I have a picture of my wife with our little dog, Missy. And Missy is standing with her back legs on Kay's legs and her little paws right up here. And she is staring as intently into Kay's face as possible because it's just nearly time to eat. What do you think I'm going to do with that picture? Put it outside in the rain, the sun? No. I'm going to try to keep just a picture. It's just a picture. But if we are that interested in protecting material things, how serious should we be in protecting the spiritual things that Jesus gave to us? How serious must we be? Matthew 7, 15, false prophets are coming in sheep's clothing. Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. 
The last 14 verses of the Sermon on the Mount are about guarding the Word. Guarding the Word that He gave. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and cast out demons in Your name and do many mighty works in Your name? And we would surely say, isn't that enough? And here's what Jesus said. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Why? You workers of lawlessness. What law? His law. You're doing a lot of religious things that looks good. And you're doing it in my name. But you're not doing my will. Why is it that important? Why is it that precious? Why did Jesus come and die to put it in effect? Unless it was that precious. But Jesus is not through guarding it. Chapter 24 of Matthew. Beginning in verse, verses 4 and 5. In fact the whole chapter deals with this. See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. Chapter 24, verses 10 through 12. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Jesus is guarding His covenant. Chapter 24, verses 23 and 24. If someone says to you, look, here's Christ. There He is. Do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Why would Jesus say these things? Why would He repeat it again and again? And these are not the only places that Jesus has spoken such a way. I'm going to share with you something else he said. This is in the book of Revelation, chapter, uh, chapter, pardon me, had the references there. Revelation chapter uh, 2, verses 14 and 15. I have a few things against you. He's talking to the church at Pergamum. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Why does Jesus care? You have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Why does he care? What is there about the new covenant that is so precious, so important, that Jesus himself guards it again and again against pollution by other things that don't come from him? The apostles have something to say. Jesus continues in chapter 2 and verse 20 as he wrote to the Apostle John or spoke to the Apostle John, I have this against you, church at Thyatira, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and eat food sacrifice to idols. Why does he care? Why doesn't his grace cover all of this? Because his grace is contained in the new covenant. That's where His grace is. His grace is not out here. It's not out here. It's in His new covenant. And one of the greatest challenges of any church today is to be totally true to the new covenant in its faith and its practices. And if it starts bringing things in from the outside, it's not the church Jesus wanted to build. It's something else. It's that important. Part of. Listen to the Apostle Peter in chapter 2 and verse 1. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Listen to James chapter 4 and verse 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
How precious is that covenant? How important is that covenant? It is so important that Jesus guarded it with some stern, stern words. And the apostles, the inspired writers, guarded it too. And I've only given you two examples so far. Let's listen now to what the apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. Who are these people leaving? They're the people who are not staying with the covenant that Jesus died to establish. They may have added something, may they have taken something away, but it's not what Jesus gave them. They were willing to take what Jesus gave as precious as it was, the fact that he died to put it into effect, and mixing it with something else or taking something out. Whatever it was, it wasn't what Jesus had given them. Further, listen to what Paul says in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 19 and 30, 29 and 30, I'm sorry. He's talking to the elders of the church in Ephesus. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will men arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. The inspired writers and Jesus himself considered the new covenant that Jesus brought into being so precious, so valuable, that you can break into Fort Knox with a fork and a spoon before you can change the word of God and God be pleased. I don't know what material possession you consider to be the most precious that you have at your house. But you probably don't keep it on the front porch. You probably don't let little children play with it if it's breakable. You guard it. It has meaning to you. I have a rock in our corner curio cabinet. It's a flat rock. It's an ideal skipping rock. And it was given to me by some folks, some of the kids at camp, where we took them to camp many years ago and we would skip rocks across the water. And on that rock is written, Skipping Rock Camp. Why do, I, why do I not put that outside? Because that little rock, that little rock brings back memories. That little rock means something to me. And brothers and sisters, if that little rock means something to me, so that I don't put it out for exposure and somebody else to take it. How should I treat the covenant that Jesus has given us the New Testament? With even greater concern and greater care and greater love for it brings to my mind more than that little rock ever could. I would give up everything in that curio cabinet in the twinkling of an eye before I'd be willing to start changing the covenant that Jesus died to give us. Wouldn't you? Amen. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Why so many warnings? Why so many warnings? If we only see the warnings as a negative, we fail to see why the warnings are there. They're there because of the preciousness. It wasn't three animals whose blood Jesus walked through to establish the New Testament as his covenant. It was his own blood that dripped from the cross. 
that put that covenant into being. That guaranteed the word of God to be true. Summary, God is true to his word. His promise, his oath, his covenant confirms it. Jesus is true to his word, his miracles, his signs, the shedding of his blood that ordained the covenant. And we must be true to the word of God. I like what Jeremiah said in chapter 42 and verse 4. I have heard you. Behold, I'm going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words. And I will tell you the whole message which the Lord will answer you. And I will not keep back a word from you. What if he had kept back some of God's message? They wouldn't have had God's message. They'd have had Jeremiah's edition of God's message. But in the Old Testament, when God spoke through a prophet, their job was to tell them everything God wanted them to be told for them to hear. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 and 2 after Jeremiah 42 and 4. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand in which also you are saved, if you, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you have believed in vain. In John chapter, that was a wrong reference, that was actually 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. If you hold fast the word, John 6 and 63, the words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's Jesus. Behind every challenge we face as individual Christians and as the church that Jesus built, the spiritual body of Christ, there is a strong and solid foundation. And that is His Word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what does the word say? If I want to be saved, what do I need to do? And I'm only going to give you four quick references, something to think about. Number one, Romans 10 and verse 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. If you want to have the kind of faith that saves, get into God's word because that's where it comes from. It is not implanted. It is gained from the Word of God. If I don't know what God says, I can't have faith in what He says. Secondly, I need to repent. That means to turn from and turn to Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent. This doesn't mean to feel sorry for doing wrong. It means to decide to turn from the doing of wrong to the doing of God's will. A lot of people think repentance is sorrow. It may be included, but repentance that the Bible talks about is a decision. This is the way I have been living. This is the way God wants me to live. I need to turn from this and turn to that. That's Repentance. Following the repentance is our willingness to confess our faith before others. Matthew 10 and verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before man, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. And then, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, after Saul of Tarsus had been praying for three days, fasting for three days, having seen Jesus, having seen a vision of Ananias, he is told in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And then what? Put first things first for the rest of your life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
And then what? And then what? Then, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord.